Hi, folks. Thank you. It's, uh, I know it's beer 30 right now for some of you, and I uh, appreciate you, uh, you being here at 520, right before all the parties. So I'm going to try not to keep you, uh, you know, past the, the 6 p.m. Uh, cutoff so you can make it over to uh, HP's party. Uh, so I'm, I'm Das Kamhout. I work at uh, Intel IT. I'm a principal engineer, and I'm responsible for all of our, uh, our cloud efforts, uh, basically everything from software as a service down to our infrastructure. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about today is, uh, is a lot of our work on specifically and what we're doing with OpenStack. But I, I'm going to paint the story of, uh, of what we're doing and why. So I'm going to go over our cloud journey, um, our hybrid open cloud, uh, what the goals are and what we are with reality right now, and then uh, an overall summary. Um, I did include here, uh, it'll be on the slides, but we actually have a white paper we just published about uh, three or four weeks ago um, that goes into a lot of the details um, about the, the architecture uh, and the solution that we're using inside of our uh, Intel IT Open Cloud. Um, so just a little bit about, about Intel IT right now. Uh, we're about 6,000 employees. We cover uh, pretty much everything inside of um, Intel. That includes our, our design environment, which is about 50,000 uh, grid servers. Uh, that was uh, my, my background where I, where I got started at Intel. Um, it also includes our manufacturing environments and then our traditional IT. Uh, we have uh, about 91,000 Intel employees, 67 data centers, about 75,000 servers uh, across the globe, and, and, and lots of devices, lots of handhelds. And it all comes together into uh, what we do uh, to support our, our end users. Um, so I wanted to first uh, talk a little bit about uh, a cloud maturity model. So this is something that the Open Data Center Alliance, and we use inside of Intel IT uh, to describe where we're going. Um, I've heard a lot of talks uh, while, while here at, at the summit about uh, you know, things about cloud-architected apps, uh, enterprise IT, um, and sensed a, a lot of confusion onto what's actually going on and what an enterprise IT shop does. Um, so my background's in the design grid space where we're pretty used to the concept of uh, destroying servers. It's very similar to what you'd experience uh, in a cloud environment today. Uh, but most enterprise IT shops um, are dealing with uh, what I call a legacy app. Um, if you talk, caught the CERN discussion, he compared uh, to pets and, and cattle. Uh, pets being something you have to nurse, but, but fundamentally the difference is, uh, and cattle you shoot, but fundamentally the difference is that with the legacy applications, um, they, they, don't, uh, they need a resilient uh, infrastructure. Uh, they expect that the infrastructure stays up. Um, these are a lot of the concepts that came back from uh, even mainframe days where you, you assume things would stay up. So if you go inside of Enterprise IT Shop today and you look at their ERP systems, or if you look at uh, even things like their mess the mail systems and their collaboration systems, all these things are built with the assumption that the server is always there, and they have none of these concepts that we like to talk about, about cloud-architected apps. So reality is these legacy apps exist, and they'll probably exist for a while. Um, so when, when we talk about cloud, uh, it's, you know, and, and again, this conference is, is very much infrastructure-focused, but the reason we do cloud is actually for our end users. These are people that are trying to get access to their apps and data um, anytime, anywhere from any device. Um, and a lot of what's going on in the industry today is software as a service. So you're seeing, uh, you know, we had Workday's IPO recently, very interesting company, uh, working against uh, uh, former PeopleSoft guys. Um, but if you look across um, where we're focusing, it's really on, on the end user, but how does that happen? We have app developers um, that need to build applications that support these end users, and what they're consuming is, uh, is hopefully cloud infrastructure. Um, so when we focus at cloud, it's about how do we build a, a low-level infrastructure that exposes software through APIs, so we, we picked OpenStack to do that, um, and give the software guys the ability to then expose that um, out to the end user. So you gotta see this from a, a pretty full picture um, to understand how you're going to operate uh, in a cloud movement uh, area moving forward. Um, another thing to point out is as you move down this path, um, SaaS becomes more and more interesting for enterprise shop. Um, today we run lots and lots of on-premise uh, licensed software um, but you know this is changing. Um, so today, the problems that we have about how to run these legacy applications isn't going to be here in probably the next uh, um, five to ten years. Or if we're moving at a very fast pace of technology, which I think a lot of us feel we are, you know, this change to legacy apps to move the SaaS route is going to move pretty pretty quickly. Um, so what that leads you to is, is how do you focus on, on your application space? Uh, we break it out into two things: we have the cloud aware and the legacy apps. Um, but as I go through this discussion, I just want to be clear that there are these, these two distinctions. Um, our focus and the Open Data Center Alliance focus is how do we drive down this path to the open industry, get things normalized, and into a path where you know, we, 
We don't talk about public or private cloud. There's no hybrid cloud. It's just this big federated interoperable open cloud. It runs across the globe. We have APIs that can talk to each other. Uh, we have federated identities. Uh, we have a, a market that allows us to connect things. Uh, people won't have conversations about how hard, hard it is to get the data and pull your data back out. Um, and so this is where we're going. And, and we feel uh, you know, there's, there's some step functions to get there. Uh, part of it is uh, investing in, in infrastructure as a service solutions. Um, but uh, we're moving pretty uh, full bore for Intel IT in regards to enabling hybrid applications. And so I'm going to be talking uh, quite a bit about that. Um, from an IT cloud strategic direction, we really have three main points we're looking at. One is what I talked about earlier. How do I make sure that my end users, which are all the Intel employees, uh, can get to their apps and data anytime? And that means I got to supply infrastructure solutions so my software developers and, and various applications can make that happen. Uh, the second point is driving the transformation to a large scale uh, automated hybrid cloud infrastructure. So another thing about traditional IT or enterprise shops is, is most of it is run by, by button clickers. Um, so we have people that uh, utilize GUIs. Uh, they're very familiar with um, uh, reading through manuals and, 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 and pressing, pressing buttons, not necessarily operating at, at scale um, through automation. Uh, so uh, we're fortunate enough at Intel IT to also have uh, this very large scale grid environment. Um, so we, uh, many of us grew up with the concepts of, of automation and working at scale. A uh, cloud is a great thing because it brings all these concepts to bear uh, to the wider market. Um, so one of our focuses is, is driving this shift. Um, and the third is one thing we care about too is, is how do we help other enterprise IT shops uh, and the whole industry move to cloud? Uh, this is both the private and the public because uh, if everybody bands together and has a single voice, uh, we believe that the community can, can move the, the needle uh, much quicker. Um, so we're very, very big on finding other enterprise IT shops uh, that are willing to help uh, you know, pave the path of where we need to go on cloud. Um, so just a little bit of background. Uh, we, we've actually been running uh, enterprise private cloud. If you look at NIST definitions, uh, it pretty much meets all of these, you know, on-demand self-service, measured services, uh, elasticity, um, resource pooling. Um, so we have a pretty much most of our environment today is virtualized for traditional IT. Uh, just one, one note, our grid environment, which is about 50,000 servers, there's no virtualization whatsoever. Uh, it's purely bare metal, uh, fairly large scale, very high utilization. 80% um, of all of our new services land in our internal cloud environment today. And uh, you, know, you know, it's not that sexy anymore, but it's about one hour to deploy infrastructure. So we went from like 90 days to down to one hour. So it was a, it was a big contrast for us. But of course, you can go to uh, Google Compute Engine or, or AWS and you can get infrastructure in, in minutes, right? Or in some scenarios, seconds. Um, but this was a big change for traditional IT shops is, is how do you enable uh, this acceleration? Um, but we realized you know, this, this wasn't enough and a lot of our work was uh, internal. Uh, so it was, it was technical debt that we were building. Uh, we were taking a lot of proprietary locked in solutions and we were taking our own code, putting it on top and making all this work. And we knew that in the long term we couldn't make this happen. Uh, so we made a decision uh, late last year uh, that we, uh, we felt that OpenStack uh, was ready um, to, to start investing in uh, from our, our technical team's perspective. So where we're going with this is how do we uh, land applications in minutes? So it's less about just a server. An application means many, many servers, landing the application stack, getting it all configured, getting the load balancer, making it take load. So it's a much more sophisticated approach. Uh, you know, press a button or call an API and, and get it up and running. Um, we also need a bursting capacity. Um, so I'm a pretty firm believer that most enterprise IT shops never need bursting capacity. Uh, they're either going to run a, a private environment or they're going to be on the public cloud. Most don't have a scenario where they need extra capital uh, environments. Because if you go look at the utilization of most enterprise IT shops, it's 10%. Uh, the ones that are pushing the envelope are maybe 20%. Um, so you, know, you have enough buffer already that, that bursting doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and then SaaS for non-differentiated apps. So what I mean by non-differentiated, uh, Intel is a, is a design company. If you guys haven't heard of us, you know, we make CPUs, we design them, and we do massive uh, manufacturing, so high volume manufacturing. So we focus you know, really on these two core aspects. So the question I often ask our, our IT team is, you know, is email something we actually need to run on premise, or is it at the point right now that it works great as SaaS? And you can take that even further. You know, people say ERP, or uh, you know, the, the systems that, that run a lot of our supply chain stuff, is this still differentiated, or is this at a point, or getting to a point pretty soon where this stuff will run you know, in the public cloud as software. Um, so you know, that, that goes to the, the point I was making earlier about the maturity model and the, the move to, uh, to SaaS. 
So that was a little bit of the background. I'm going to jump into uh, our IT uh, hybrid open cloud. Um, so for first, a few key concepts that we, uh, we took in uh, uh, on this, this project. So first was we need to abstract our users uh, from the underlying cloud providers. And the key word there is providers. So we need to support multiple uh, cloud providers. So one thing that I, I heard a lot here um, is a lot of focus on OpenStack. We, we like OpenStack a lot, but the reality is, is there's many, many clouds, and we expect there to be. Um, we need to uh, be building solutions that allow us uh, to abstract all the users across these many different environments. So, so Amazon is very real. Google Compute Engine is very real. I'm sure we'll see more clouds show up. If you do business in China, there's uh, different cloud environments there. You have to be able to, if you operate at global scale, to make it easy for your users to use all these different options, even though our choice uh, internally is OpenStack. Um, we need common identity um, for entitlement across all these, these interfaces. And we also made a choice internally that we'd go open source first. So rather than building up a technical debt, uh, we can minimize our proprietary API lock-in and we can utilize the community uh, to help scale these solutions. Uh, one thing interesting that I've found is, uh, is most IT shops, we all have the almost identical problems. Uh, nothing is new. Um, the only difference is, is where you are on your maturity model and what you're doing uh, in your environments. But uh, I've seen, I haven't seen any IT shop that actually has a, a large difference in what they're trying to achieve. Um, so it's, uh, we're pretty happy that we're seeing something like OpenStack uh, work into the community now. Um, and we also have to stay pragmatic as we scale. Most enterprise IT shops have a fairly large investment uh, in solutions uh, that are already running, whether it's their storage environments. Uh, we chose in our, our first OpenStack implementation to go Greenfield, um, but there's a high likelihood that uh, you know, we will need to be connecting to uh, solutions that we already have in our environment, that we already spend capital on. Uh, so it's good to see things like Cinder, um, thinking about how do you have multiple storage solutions on the back end. So we, we encourage this and, and like to see this approach uh, to allow us to have many, many solutions uh, behind the APIs. Um, so uh, just on, on an overview too, where we're going, um, I, I talked a bit about the, the end user view. Uh, we, we need those reusable services at every, st every layer of the stack. Uh, so first of all, you know, we are Intel, so we use Intel underneath. Um, but it's not all about you know, one type of cookie cutter uh, uh, server. Um, we have multiple types of uh, server solutions that we would use. Uh, for instance, there's, there's Intel Atom, which uh, you know, he'll plenty about uh, ARM, but uh, Intel Atom we believe would be a, a, good, uh, a good solution to, to meet that use case. Um, Intel Xeon, you know, everybody's pretty familiar with, you know, your, your traditional box. And then we've been recently uh, exploring uh, Xeon Phi, which is uh, a competition to the traditional GPUs. The point is, is, is there's a heterogeneous environment is what's needed in order to run your infrastructure services of both storage, compute, and, and, and network, all three. Um, so OpenStack obviously is very much focused at this layer, uh, but however, in order to make this actually work for your end users, you need this entire stack. You need uh, some application platform services. Uh, we're investing in PaaS. Uh, we have a, a PaaS environment running inside. We use uh, Cloud Foundry and Iron Foundry today. Um, and, then, uh, but in, and then as you move up, you need application services that people can use. So you need location, how to make it easy that people can reuse uh, these APIs across the stack. I just want to go over to uh, our, our approach to, uh, to release cadence. So we've also heard some other enterprise IT shops say uh, uh, the six month of OpenStack releases is, is too much. Um, I feel differently. I think it, uh, it needs to be at that pace if we're going to keep, uh, keep up the speed that's necessary. Um, I have a slide later that talks about a lot of the gaps that we see um, but in order to, uh, to keep pace where things need to go, we need to be at six months and we need to move uh, fairly aggressively. Uh, we are at a hyper evolution of technology and it's important to move at a, a faster clip than you've ever moved before. And then figure out means of how you do continuous uh, 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 rollouts inside of your environment. So we see you know, physical infrastructure, you see new stuff about 12 to 18 months, obviously not refresh every, anything that fast. Uh, you see OpenStack at six months, and then uh, we have this area of manageability and uh, the API on top that we expect to be moving at a three-month cadence. And where I'd like to be uh, towards the end of next year is where we're just releasing code, similar to what you see at eBay or Etsy, where they're just uh, rolling out code every week and, and the end users don't even notice. Um, so this next slide is, is about the gap. So uh, I, I don't want to leave the wrong impression. Um, we, we, we like OpenStack. We think it's a, a good, solid first foundation, but uh, I wanted to highlight some things in red um, as areas that, that need to be focused on. Uh, some of these are just areas that we haven't implemented yet, 
uh, some are areas that uh, actually need to be uh, addressed by the community. Um, if you go and look at, at some of the public cloud providers today, even just at infrastructure as a service, uh, you'll see quite a few um, of these, these functions on the left uh, available as APIs, right? So our, our focus, as I stated earlier, was everything needs to be exposed uh, as software, as APIs. Um, so therefore, you know, even if we have some infrastructure solution today, uh, we need to be able to uh, turn on an API uh, so we can uh, um, use multiple solutions behind the scenes and give our software developers the ability to uh, have, have these reusable backwards compatible APIs. So like for instance, you know, we, we use Puppet, um, but uh, we, we don't have an API in front of it. So people have to go into uh, a, a Puppet um, to actually build out their, their domain models. Um, so we, we need some solutions that allow us to have APIs across the entire stack. Uh, you heard uh, Chris Kemp talk about DNS. You know, we, we need DNS uh, solutions inside of OpenStack. There's, there's nothing there. Um, and you can go to AWS and, and see Route 53 and other solutions. Uh, so my point really here is uh, as you start building out entire infrastructure as a solutions service stack, uh, you need to, uh, we need to build out more um, in order to have a, a full robust uh, a solution. Um, so what do we have right now? So we, uh, as I stated about uh, in December timeframe, we made a decision to do um, our, our cloud environment on OpenStack. So this is a greenfield space. Uh, we have a fairly large existing enterprise private cloud that's mostly uh, built by us. Uh, but this is a greenfield space that we decided, hey, we're just gonna go uh, basically pure open source as much as possible. There's still a few things that uh, are not open source, um, but we're working to, to make it all open. Um, just call out a few of the key technologies. Uh, we're using Essex now, uh, making plans to, to roll out Folsom. Uh, Nagios for monitoring configuration for, is using Puppet. Um, and we, uh, of course, uh, you know, have hardware load balancers um, on the edge uh, and handling our VIPs, um, connecting back into our internal environment. So this is all an externally facing space. Uh, so we picked our, our most complex uh, use case in order to prove out what, what OpenStack could do. Um, and today we're, we are running in production, you know, cutting edge web services um, on a predominantly uh, open source cloud. Um, just one point too, I, I don't actually have this in the slides, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are running a, a pass environment on top of it here too. So we basically put Cloud Foundry and Iron Foundry um, on top of OpenStack and, and that runs uh, quite well. Uh, so some of the details on, on our uh, cloud approach. So it wasn't about just landing in one data center. Uh, we, we worked uh, across two of our data centers um, and an external provider. Uh, the reason why is because we needed to run in, in a, a active, active, active mode to achieve uh, a four nines of availability. Four nines availability is about uh, 52 minutes of downtime a year. Um, so in, in order to do that, you really can't have uh, humans involved. And also since, uh, if you're familiar with OpenStack, you know, your, your VMs can, can die. Uh, there's no concepts of, of live migration. So we really needed something that was cloud architected and can uh, work at scale across many locations. Um, so we, we have all three locations working together. Um, you know, you can take load in any location at any time. We're using, uh, you know, MySQL replication solutions. Um, we're treating it all as, as one data center though. So if you think about what I said earlier about how do we, how do we uh, work across all these different environments, if I choose uh, next year I want to add another external provider, I want to be able to turn that on fairly easily, but for my software developers, I want them to notice not, no difference, right? They should just be getting their compute, getting their storage, uh, getting what they need to run their software, but not knowing uh, necessarily that I've actually turned on yet another uh, cloud provider. So um, I talked about the, the four nines availability. One other thing that we did that, uh, uh, that we, we designed in is, is the ability to do self-remediation. So we, we built this concept, we try to keep it really simple. Um, obviously, you know, we have those various solutions from, from the network fabric up to the application layer, uh, but we used uh, just simple concepts of watcher, decider, and actor. Um, so our watcher that we picked was Nagios, but uh, you know, it's the concept of watching that's important. Um, you know, we could replace Nagios with something else in the future. Uh, it fit the use case well for what we're doing. Uh, that had a combination of operating systems and, and a pretty rich community. Um, so we watch all the, the various uh, uh, capabilities that are running in the environment. Uh, we can feed this into a decider that does analysis correlation. A fairly simple analysis right now, you know, can it, uh, uh, should it turn something off, right? Because what we want to look for is if something's having an issue in the environment, uh, we want to shut it down um, so that it doesn't cause issues for the end users. And then an actor that initiates action, uh, so where, where Puppet can, uh, can take action against the environment 
um, because it understands how the entire environment operates together and is able to, uh, to make, uh, uh, take those actions based on the decision. So a simple flow, um, but we feel this is necessary uh, to give us four nines and where we're going with our, uh, our five nines goal um, the next year. Um, so another thing that we had to focus on was a, a cloud-aware application. So um, most of our, our developers uh, were familiar with, with traditional development practices. Um, and so we, uh, we basically said, hey, you know, this is, this is actually quite a bit of different space. Um, most of these developers weren't familiar with grid computing. Uh, they, they thought, you know, everything was, should be stateful. Uh, you, if your server dies, you know, that's a problem in the infrastructure. Um, so one, one thing we, we do is we go out and we try to help them understand what, what are the changes that you have to take in order to develop uh, for the cloud environment. So you, you have to shift the stateless. Um, and I do call out, by the way, there's a, there's a white paper up here too. Um, our friends at Disney uh, put this together. The guys run Disney.com. Uh, they're part of the Open Data Center Alliance too. Um, and they publish this. There's, there's seven rules. So if your developers are not doing uh, Cloudware uh, yet, encourage you to take a look at that. It's, it's pretty detailed and, and covers some of the principles we go after. Uh, but some of those, if you're, if you're not familiar with it, you know, shift the stateless. So assume failure uh, pretty much at all layers. Uh, you should scale horizontally. Uh, most enterprise uh, applications today only stand, understand scaling up. And if you scale up, you always hit a ceiling, right? So you want to scale horizontal. Uh, to meet uh, the needs of your, of your demand signal. Uh, eventual consistency at the data layer. So uh, again, a lot of enterprise apps assume that you have to have constant uh, consistency um, at, at the data layer, but uh, that's not necessarily true, um, and there's ways to get around this. You can't obviously probably do this in the banking industry today, but, uh, or if you have a situation like a, a hotel reservation, um, if you had two people coming in and trying to get the exact same room, you know, your hotel could be oversold pretty quickly. But for many, many use cases, uh, you know, eventual consistency works great. Um, we push heavily to shift to the DevOps model or the no-ops model. So uh, uh, DevOps uh, was, was fairly familiar to a, a number of us on our team. Um, but uh, you know, the focus that we want is never wait on IT, right? If everything's exposed as a software service, uh, your, your software developers should be able to, to build solutions um, and do this at scale without ever having to even talk to an IT person. And what we really want is the IT infrastructure team uh, to become invisible, right? You shouldn't have to uh, talk to them or, or call them. They keep the infrastructure running. Uh, they keep the API exposed. Uh, they meet the SLAs and quality of service requirements. Uh, but really, they become invisible, which is similar to uh, you know, the no-ops model. Um, and implement true web services for consumption. Uh, so this means things like uh, make sure that your, your web services uh, have quality of service. They can throttle and they themselves uh, scale and utilize these concepts. Um, so, so that was on cloud architecture, uh, cloud architected apps. Uh, the other area that we deal with is, is what I talked about, the, the legacy and traditional um, enterprise um, IT type applications. So these are, these are a few of the areas that we need to close for enterprise. Uh, we, we, it's been encouraging to hear uh, at the summit a lot of progress being made in, in some key areas. Um, but these are still some of the ones that, that we see as issues. Uh, one is uh, uh, in traditional IT, you, you got to keep that server up. Um, and if your, your host dies, you know, you don't want to, if you're running 40 VMs on a host, uh, running it pretty hot, you know, you, you just lost 40 VMs. And if somebody's running an uh, email server on there, you know, that's not going to go over very well for your end users because probably that email application wasn't built uh, for the concept of, of a server dying. Right, so you, you gotta solve this problem, or we have to solve this problem uh, for the traditional legacy apps because they will be here for a while. Even if they go to the SaaS model, um, I guarantee you know, most IT shops will have these. Uh, so there's some, you know, three major points here. Um, shared block storage, so you, you need to have a, a shared block storage solution which lets you uh, do things like live migration. So just a simple thing like a maintenance of a host, uh, or even if you wanna upgrade your host, you know, most, uh, enterprise solutions today that do uh, virtualization uh, allow this, of course, because it's a use case that's pretty important to IT shops. Um, a restart of instance when a host fails. So if your host is gonna fail, I'd like to make sure that those 40 VMs uh, start right back up on another host. You know, it's not, uh, it's not insurmountable, and these are uh, pieces that, that should be coming into, uh, into the environment here. Um, and then the next part is enabling a federated hybrid cloud environment. So talked a bit about how, uh, you know, we. Uh, we like OpenStack, but it's not uh, the only cloud solution we, we, we're going to use. Um, there are public cloud solutions. It's good to see uh, more public cloud providers exposing uh, OpenStack APIs. 
Uh, but the reality is, is there's a pretty rich ecosystem uh, that's not OpenStack. So, so how do you make sure you can connect to them? Uh, we want end users be able to have seamless access across um, the zones, the regions, across clouds. Uh, today, even if you have a, a two instances of OpenStack inside of your environment, um, there's not necessarily something built today that allows you to interact with both of them uh, you know, in, in one call. Um, we need identity federated across these. So uh, if somebody has an identity, um, just like you know, we as end users today, we're pretty used to a single sign-on or, or you may even use your login with Facebook button because you're a consumer. But the same type of approach for, for a lot of software developers, they want an easy way uh, to be able to uh, authenticate and get uh, their identity federated across multiple environments. Um, and then orchestration. So uh, since I'm dealing with many types of cloud environments, I need a way uh, for the software developer to be able to uh, consume xCloud, consume uh, the OpenStack cloud, all in a seamless fashion. We don't want them to have to learn uh, the innards of every type of cloud environment. We, we want a single API uh, facade that is exposed to them so they can deal with compute in one way, you know, they can deal with object storage in one way, they can deal with networking in one way, but really give it to the software developers so that they can function uh, seamlessly um, across multiple clouds. Uh, and um, we, we also need high availability of infrastructure services. So the cloud should be built as a cloud, right? You should make sure that the components that are inside your cloud, uh, if they're failing, you know, they should be stateless as much as possible so they can uh, uh, run on, on other systems. Uh, you should use concepts like eventual consistency, consistency uh, but there's core features of OpenStack today that we're not using um, because you know, they have single points of failure. Uh, a big one that I, I didn't hear a lot of people talk about, but uh, in order for this to work in a lot of uh, us that have even just SOX compliance, um, you, you have to go in and deal with the, the security and the, the auditability of, of the environment. So we need role-based ac role access uh, for people, right? Sometimes uh, you know, the person that runs the infrastructure should never have access to the application. Um, so there's certain segmentation that's required, as well as you need to be able to audit who's, who's really getting out there. If you've ever worked with uh, the regula regulation groups out there, you know, they're, they're very, very strict. They even hate things like, like multi-tenancy. Um, so I think it's, it's important to understand that uh, uh, companies that are regulated have to go through quite a bit of, uh, of rigor to make sure that their infrastructure and their applications are, are meeting the conditions uh, of the regulators. So it's not a simple thing. Um, it's a big problem to solve, uh, and, uh, and we, we encourage to see that as we move forward, uh, the community helps make this happen. Uh, this isn't a common problem for startups. I thought it was interesting, uh, in one of the keynotes, you know, 80% of startups are, uh, are using public cloud today, but I, I guarantee most of those startups don't have uh, the same type of regulatory uh, requirements that uh, a lot of the big enterprises have, nor do they have some of the issues in regards to uh, liability a lot of, uh, of the large enterprise shops have. So it's important to get some focus onto these tough challenges that we have. Uh, we have published a much larger list. You know, it didn't fit on a slide, so uh, I, I just made sure it, it is public. Um, these slides will be up on SlideShare later, but uh, uh, you can find it out on the internet. Um, and we want to have this in, in open dialogue. So we, we would like to get some other enterprise IT shops uh, that are interested in, in making this happen. Um, we've set out a goal. We believe within uh, nine to 12 months, uh, uh, post Grizzly, um, a lot of these uh, functions that we need are actually, it looks like they're going to be there. Um, and what this gives us is the ability uh, to start taking you know, traditional IT workloads um, onto our, our, uh, our open cloud environment. And if anybody has solved these already, we also want to hear from you and want to talk to you and figure out uh, you know, how we can uh, partner together uh, to make this happen for, for the whole industry. So uh, just on a wrap up, so our direction, uh, as I stated earlier, it's a, it's a federated inter interoperable and open cloud. Uh, what we mean by that is uh, cloud services should work uh, seamlessly, you know, regardless of what cloud vendor there is. Uh, if you listen to, uh, to some of the big cloud players today, they're not really that interested in, in interoperable solutions um, because in reality, the market's actually young, right? So a lot of stuff is happening, but you know, getting uh, Google and, and Microsoft to sit down and, and talk about uh, an API, um, you know, it's not gonna happen very fast. And, and if you try to use a standards body today, you know, I like standards bodies, but they don't move fast enough, right? Our technology is moving at such a fast pace that we need to find a way to have the community to insist that we need these, uh, this open environment. And, and there's lots of cool things going on. We have OpenStack, uh, we have the Open Compute Project. If you're not familiar, familiar with that, I'd take a look at it. Um, and we have the Open Data Center Alliance. And even beyond that, 
We have people making uh, uh, brick manufacturing solutions that are open source. So point being is uh, open stuff is happening uh, everywhere, um, and we need this in order to, to push the industry forward where, where we all need it to go. Um, we've had some pretty strong success with our enterprise private cloud, um, as I showed earlier, you know, uh, pretty good measures on, on what we're doing, but it, it wasn't enough and it increased a, n a large amount of technical debt for us um, and we felt the community was really uh, pushing the envelope in regards to what's possible uh, with infrastructure as a service. Uh, we are in production now. Uh, we're taking, uh, we're running production workloads, um, uh, but these are for cloud architected apps or cloud aware applications and our, our target next is for, for enterprise uh, IT applications, you know, one that expect uh, resilience. Uh, we think there's lots of space uh, for people to contribute. So our, our personal Intel IT team, we're working through our, our legal process right now. Uh, we intend to contribute. Uh, we have some interesting areas of code um, that we would like to put into the community, uh, either directly into OpenStack or around. We'd like to see other enterprise IT shops take the same approach. Uh, you know, we've seen uh, some of them be very successful um, in getting started here, and we'd like to encourage this. And as I said earlier, you know, seeking other large scale uh, enterprise shops to, to help uh, pave this path. Uh, there's a lot to do, um, and there's a lot that we can make happen. Uh, and, and again, everybody's problem is almost identical, so it's uh, not like everybody has to go reinvent the wheel. Uh, but I do want to point out, too, that uh, um, as I talk about SaaS, I think enterprise IT is going to change massively in the next uh, three to five years. Um, just like most startups are 80% you know, on, on public cloud today, uh, I think if uh, as those, those startups grow, um, will they really go private? You know, it's a, it's a good question. We've seen uh, companies like Zynga that have uh, you know, gone public and then pulled all their infrastructure in uh, with their Z Cloud. But uh, in many situations, what we do in enterprise IT shops, a lot of the, the mail systems, uh, the collaboration, a lot of this should be running uh, as software as a service um, at scale. So large change happening next two to five years. Uh, a couple resources for you. Uh, uh, I think I, I talked about the Open Data Center line quite a bit. Um, it is a group of about 300 global IT teams that are working together uh, to set the, the path of, uh, of, of cloud for, for enterprise IT shops. Obviously, cloud exists, but enterprise IT has certain requirements that we need uh, for the environment to happen. And uh, Intel IT, we're pretty happy to, to share um, what we're doing. Uh, we like to have two-way dialogue to figure out, you know, how do we move the, the industry forward? So. We have lots of information about uh, you know, pretty much everything we do. We're, we're pretty open about uh, sharing that. So uh, I know there's a HP party that starts in 10 minutes, and you guys have been great. Uh, and you probably want some beer and some drinks. But let's see if there's uh, any questions uh, from the room, even though we're at the end of the day. And if you can uh, come up to the mic, we're, uh, we have some video. If you can use the mic. Can you talk a little bit about how you have implemented multi-tenancy within your private cloud? Uh, how we, yeah, so uh, basically um, each tenant. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, how have you isolated the tenants together? It's, I've used VLANs, firewalling. So we're basically yeah. using security groups. Um, so each one gets uh, their, their own in VLAN environment and then we carve it up with uh, IP tables to do network segmentation across them. We're using uh, Nova Networks today and our intent is to switch to Quantum uh, uh, with Grizzly. So following the previous question, once you associate the you know, floating IP uh, to a different uh, content, they are interconnected. Is there any, any uh, concern for that? That's one question. Uh, secondly, um, uh, you talked about your, you, you are ma migrating uh, Greenfield application to this uh, cloud infrastructure. And uh, can you elaborate uh, some examples? Um, yeah, so for the first question, I'll, I'll let you talk to my, the networking guy right over there. He'll, he'll connect with you. Uh, but for the second one on the Greenfield apps, uh, these, are, these are basically uh, uh, internet web apps that are exposing APIs. So uh, fundamentally, they're going to have a, uh, a presentation layer, an app logic layer, um, some caching in between, and, and a database system uh, running in, in triplicate, active, active, active. So the database system, eventual consistency, um, but basically a workload can hit uh, any of these environments uh, spread out between a global load balancer, uh, take load and, and respond back to, to an end user. So these are the first types of apps that we're putting there, which are very standard web 2.0 uh, type applications. Um, and our focus next is how to take more traditional enterprise IT workloads and, and have them run there. Any uh, additional questions? 
Yeah, you mentioned there were some components of OpenStack that you weren't using because of single points of failure. Uh, could you elaborate on which ones they uh, are? Uh, Nova volume. Oh. That's, that's really, I think, the only one. <laughs> Um, in your slide about the watcher and the actor, are you automating any of that, or is that manual process as well? Um, so uh, we, we have automation working in dev space, but uh, right now that just basically goes to human. So the self-remediation framework is set up uh, to, to allow it to be automated, but we're making sure there's false positives and you know false negatives don't get is triggered and shut down a data center. Is that uh, a homegrown solution? Are you uh, the, the deciders, but all the concept is, is pretty straightforward, and we're using mostly off-the-shelf you know, off the shelf open source stuff. So mm -hmm. uh, it's just the concept of, of knowing what to watch, knowing if something goes down, what to do about it. So it's, it's all things that we do as humans, naturally. Sure. So our, uh, our decision was how to uh, just automate that. So, uh, okay. so if, you, if you tie it all together, um, it's, it's automation solutions that exist today. And we will, we're free to share you know, all the information of how we do that, too. Any additional questions? Okay, thanks folks and uh, take care.